Alrighty, listen up, you bloody hooligans. We're gonna do some. Uh, we're gonna do some shrifting. All right. We're gonna do some. We're gonna do some tight, taut literary analysis, and and we're not gonna fucking muck about this time. All right. We're we're getting right proper into it. We're gonna have no talk back here. All right. Because this is gonna be swift, swift, concise. It's gonna be great. We're talking about Tyrion Lannister. This is Tyrion's third chapter in A Clash of Kings, the second Game of Thrones book, and this is episode 89 of Game of Thrones Abridged. Thanks for coming. Um, this is apparently the, th- the the three year anniversary of this series, Game of Thrones Abridged. Brandon on Twitter said that this is our third year anniversary. Um, I don't believe it. Um, I think that, I mean, you could have told me anything and like, like, like one year, five years, 15, I don't count time. I don't believe in clocks. Uh, I don't trust anything with hands, uh, which has complicated my interpersonal relationships over the years, but three years, my God, I've had marriages that lasted less long than that. Um, you know how there are those traditional gifts for, like, every anniversary in a marriage? Like, like, year one, you give, like, a pearl, and year five, you give something made out of wood, and year ten, something out of adamantium, and year, year fifteen, you have to give something made out of moon rocks, and, and, and year twenty, it's gotta be, um, it's gotta be enriched, uh, polonium, and, like, year fifty-five, it's gotta be, like, the beating heart of, of a, of a spriggan. Um, the, the, the three year anniversary gift traditionally is leather. You're meant to give something made out of leather, which I think is appropriate for, for Game of Thrones because there is nothing if not an awful lot of boiled leather in Game of Thrones. Everything's leather and everything's boiled, which my theory is that George uh, sort of wants to make a food description out of that because every chapter there's some long, lavish, disturbingly erotic uh, food description, talking about grease running down chins and, and capons inside peacocks, inside pigus, inside ducks, and um, and I think I think the boiled leather is maybe like a recipe, you know? Like, if you boil leather for long enough, I'm sure you could eat it. Um, so, uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome Oyster, welcome YouTube Underground, welcome Charles Helston, Kata, Thomas, Rega, everyone. Um, let's get into it. So, this is a Tyrion chapter, and as we know, at the start of this book, Tyrion rolled in to King's Landing and said, Yo, I'm the Hand of the King. And Cersei said, Fucking, you what, mate? This is my town. And then, uh, and then things started getting complicated. Um, this is, this, this, this chapter is about a deepening of the political knots and twists and dips and dykes and everything just gets, uh, more delicious. Because as everyone knows, All's fair in love and war. It's all about sex and politics, and this chapter has lots of both. Um, So put on your reading hats and let's get into it. The first line is, The Queen was not disposed to wait on Varys, which is a lovely, it's a lovely understatement. I think the best kind of, like, humor, and not even just humor, just like, just like fun, just like writing, just talking, is like the, the understatement. Um... Uh, the queen is much more than not disposed. She's fucking furious to have to wait on Varys. Uh, Cersei is furious for when anyone does anything less than everything she wants of them. Um, and Varys has not turned up to the meeting of the small council, so she is she is pissing blood. She's so angry, as they say in uh, my hometown. And uh, and Cersei says treason is vile enough, but this is barefaced naked villainy. And I do not need that mincing eunuch to tell me what must be done with villains. So what's happened is that uh, Stannis Baratheon uh, sent out a bunch of letters saying, uh, Hey guys, uh, hot tweet, bit of goss, put it on TMZ. Uh, Did you know, fun fact, uh, the Queen's been rooting her brother and the King, Joffrey, uh, is actually not the legitimate King because he's he's a grody little incest baby full of little a DNA all up in his blonde locks because uh, because the twins have been rooting and they are not legitimate heirs of the king Robert. So uh, BRB, BTW, hashtag YOLO, I'm the king. Dab. Dab on the haters. That's what Stannis said in this, like, group text that he sent out to all of the lords of Westeros. Sent, sent him out by Raven, which is, which is the TikTok of Westeros. Um, so he's told everyone that, yo, Cersei's been been rooting the wrong roots and the whole throne situation is illegitimate. 
So Cersei is furious. Um, I, I, I do enjoy this term mincing eunuch um, because the word mincing is just hilarious to me. Like mincing. Like I, I don't actually really know what mincing means. I feel like mincing is like a sort of like a physical action. It's like a little gyration. It's like, it's, it's all in the hips, mincing, you know, mincing's like grinding, you know, which is appropriate because like mincing, like the other meaning of mincing is like, it's like churning up, you know, using, you know, mincemeat, you know, you know, getting out the old, the old mincero. Um, mincing, it's like simpering. It's like, it's like ass kissing. It's like preening. It's like, I, I think it's effeminate mincing is. Um, mincing's a weird word. Um, and, and, and that's how Cersei's describing Varys. But anyway, so they're looking at these letters that Stannis has sent out to everyone. He's sent them out to everyone. Um, and Cersei is furious and she's saying, we've got to destroy these letters. We can't let anyone find out this rumor about us being incestuous because it's, uh, it's, it's just not on. Um, and Cersei turns on Tyrion with green-eyed fury. Because she's being accused of incest, adultery, and treason. So, so Tyrion is sitting there on on the small council, and he's going like, "Man, it's it's honestly impressive how angry Cersei can get about accusations that she knows perfectly well are completely true." Um, because Cersei knows that, yeah, of course, she is incestuous, and Joffrey is false. Um, but, um, but I'm honestly not so shocked because because I think that like like you know, IRL. Uh, the things that make people the angriest are the things that are true. Like, you can call some- like, if you walk up to someone on the street and say, You, sir, are, are, a, are a fiend and a wastrel because you are a, a cannibal. You've been eating children, and I know it. You know, if you say that to someone, they're, they're gonna shrug and keep on walking. Like, like, no one- like, like, an accusation that has no basis in reality is just not one that makes people angry. If someone attacks you, but says something that you know to just be totally untrue. Like, it, it usually doesn't bother you, right? Um, whereas if someone says something to you that is, like, has a grain of truth in it, that tends to be the sort of stuff that, like, actually, like, hits a nerve emotionally, you know? You get most angry when you get hit with something that's kind of true. If, if yeah, exa yeah, Sol's saying the same in the chat. Like, if someone says something about you that you're insecure about, something that touches on something that you know is like a weakness or something that you're ashamed of, something that you don't like to admit to yourself, something that you don't want other people to know is true about you, that's what really, like, riles people up, I think. So Cersei is appropriately furious here because the accusations being made are completely true. Uh, I will not suffer to be called a whore, Cersei says. Um, and Tyrion says, oh, well, you know, no one says that Jaime paid you. Uh, so that sort of foreshadows the, the sexual politics that, that pervades this chapter, uh, which we'll get into later. Um, and yeah, Tyrion thinks that, man, Cersei is getting so mad here. Maybe, maybe after the war she should take up mummery. She should be an actor. She has a gift for it. Which I think is kind of interesting given that in season six of Game of Thrones we have that actor Lady Crane playing Cersei, who's kind of like really interesting as a portrayal of Cersei, being a more sort of sympathetic character. The idea of like acting is interesting. And acting comes up comes up later in this chapter, actually, because Varys dons his secret disguise uh, as, as Rugen. That's one of the things that they left out or uh, left out of the show. Um, Varys has this predilection for dressing up as as other people. He has these fake identities so that he can go about his business and and do other things undetected in in like costumes. And he acts different, different voice, different way of walking, uh, acting. Uh, falsity, con concealment, playing roles. That's what court life is all about, and Varys embodies that. Cersei may be a good actor, but I think Varys is a far better actor. Um, and they notice that the letters, the, 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 the tweet, the mass text that was sent out to everyone, uh, XO, XO, Gossip Girl, um, it, it, op it, it says, done in the light of the Lord at the end, which Tyrion thinks is a queer choice of words. And Pycelle explains that uh, that's a term used in the Free Cities in Essos uh, because the god of the Red Priests, R'hllor, is the Lord of Light. Um, so Littlefinger's like, yeah, like, you know, we did hear that um, that Lady Selyse Baratheon, Stannis' wife, has hooked up with this Red Priestess, Melisandre, and that's why they're talking about the Lord of Light. So that's like, that's, um... That's one of these interesting sort of untold stories in A Song of Ice and Fire that I really feel 
I'm really curious about, and I'd love to know more about how exactly did this red priestess from Ashai, Melisandre, end up in the service of Stannis and Selyse Baratheon? Like, like, did Melisandre just get some, like, visions of, of this, of this lord in far, far away Westeros, and he's gonna be a relore, so, like, she crosses the whole goddamn world to get over to, uh, to Stannis? And when she did, like, how did she talk her way into Dragonstone? It seems as though Selyse was her way in. Selyse is obviously, like, an emotionally vulnerable person who is in an unhappy marriage with Stannis and has all these sad, poor relationships with, well, with her, with her sole daughter, Shireen. So Selyse is someone looking for some kind of meaning, some kind of guidance, and it makes sense that Melisandre might have been able to worm her way in there. But, like, you know, at the same time, like, Stannis is such, like, a sort of hard, uncompromising, secular dude, and it's it, it, it'd be such an interesting story, like, how he got convinced to accept Melisandre. I mean, there is that story about, like, about how Stannis had this... Uh, had this bird called Proudwing that didn't fly anywhere, and so he's like, well, you know, what I've been doing so far doesn't work, so now I'm going to get a red hawk. I'm going to change my strategies. I'm going to accept Melisandre because I need to try a different strategy here. Uh, welcome Ask Crack Pontiac to the chat. Nice name. Um, so we're talking about the Lord of Light, and Tyrion says, hey, you know, we should use the religious thing against Stannis, you know, show how he's turning against the, the faith of the Seven here. Um, but Cersei's like, no, we just need to start ripping people's tongues out. Uh, anyone who says that, that, uh, anyone who talks about incest or bastardy, we just need to rip their tongue out. And, and Grand Maester Pycelle, who is just the ultimate yes man, just says, hmm, yes, a prudent measure. Yeah, no, we should definitely just rip out everyone's fucking tongue. Yeah, no, good idea, good idea. Uh, but Tyrion's like, no, that's a terrible idea, because when you rip out someone's tongue, you're just telling the world that he, he's telling the truth. You wouldn't rip out the tongue of someone who, who was saying something that didn't, wasn't dangerous for you. Um, it's like, uh, Illyn Payne, like, like the Mad King Aerys Targaryen ripped the tongue out of Illyn Payne, uh, because Illyn Payne said that Tywin Lannister is the true power in Westeros, which, which was, of course, completely true. Um, and so that's why Ares was so insecure about it. And again, like that, you know, that's the things that make us angriest, you know? If Ilan Payne had said, did you know that Ares, Ares Targaryen, uh, did you know he has a second butt on top of his existing butt, um, and when he farts, windows break... Um, if, if Ilan Payne said that, then, like, all right, well, maybe Ares would have still ripped out his tongue, because Ares was crazy. But the point is that, like, like, the things that make people react like that tend to be the things that have an element of truth. Um, but yeah, Tyrion's like, no, 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 we need a different strategy than, like, ripping out everyone's tongue. We can, we can work something else out. And anyway, Tyrion's like, look, it's no big deal. Like, like, Stannis has no proof. Like, no one's gonna believe this story, because it's so obviously not true, right? How could anyone, how could there possibly be evidence when it's not true? And Tyrion gives his sister his sweetest smile. So Tyrion is like, Tyrion is such a fucking shit stirrer in this chapter, right? Like, cause, cause this letter, this, this accusation, this move by Stannis is a serious threat to House Lannister. It's a serious threat to the throne and this whole power. And that includes Tyrion. Like, he's on this sinking ship right next to Cersei. He's the hand of the king and all his power comes from her and, and Joffrey, which, this whole foundation of power that Stannis is attacking right at the very pillars of the foundation. And Tyrion is taking this opportunity just to, like, jab at Cersei um, when, when he's in danger here, right? Which, which, show, which is a great example of Tyrion's, like, self-destructive impulse, right? Um, because Tyrion, is, Tyrion doesn't always put self-preservation and, and the well-being of himself or of anyone in front of his, like, his pride and his bitterness and his, and his revenge. And, like, like, Tyrion feels so put upon by everyone, which, like, in some ways he is. But, but, but he's so mad at everyone that, that he will, he will hurt others at his own expense. What's that, like, Pokemon move? You know how those moves in Pokemon where you can damage another one, but you hurt yourself? Like, what's that, like, like, uh, I forget. But, like, Tyrion's basically a Pokemon who's just, like, he he wants to hurt others more than he wants to protect himself sometimes um and that includes provoking his his sister the queen um all right uh so next page um so littlefinger steps in and he's like all right we can we can i've got a strategy here like we do need to respond to this 
whole situation, uh, but I've got a better idea. Fight fire with fire. And what we're about to get here is like a crash course in fake news. Like, spoiler, did you know Game of Thrones is about politics? Because we get a great political lesson in like disinformation. Fucking psyops, man. Like, this is how you beat rumors is with rumors, Littlefinger says. Littlefinger is like the ultimate um, manipulator of lies and weaponization of information. So he steps in and does his fucking magic. So he's like, yo, all right. Here's here's the news. Um, we we spread a counter rumor. Stannis is spreading rumors about us, so we spread rumors about him. Everyone knows that Stannis and and Solis have like a shitty relationship. So let's put out the rumor that Stannis's child Shireen is is a bastard, and Stannis is a cuckold. Someone else had sex with Stannis's wife. And this and the small folk, they're always eager to believe the worst of their lords, especially those as stern. Up with Solis, she thinks, hmm, well, Solis does have two brothers and an uncle. What if she, what if Solis hooked up with one of her brothers? And, and it's just so fucking hilarious that, like, the first, uh, the first thing that Cersei thinks of and says out loud is, hmm, incest that would be plausible which is just so funny that it's just like like it's like it's it, it's subtly hinting at the truth of um of cersei's incest i think is the stream good yeah the stream dropped out for a moment we should be back uh it fool patch face is lady salisa's secret lover and the secret father of shireen which kind of has like a a slight bit of plausibility because of um patch face and shireen's relationship um, they're like, you know, they could have come up with a plausible lie, but it's better if you just come up with a ridiculous lie. Because if you just claim something that's, like, crazy, but, like, not believable, that can still sway public opinion. If you say something completely ridiculous, people will still think, well, you know, maybe it's not totally true, but, you know, if it's half true, then that would still be pretty crazy. Like, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Um, and so saying ridiculous lies over and over can, like, move people towards your point of view, even if it's not very reasonable and has no evidence. The best lies contain nuggets of truth, Littlefinger says. Um, so this is just a great lesson in, like, using lies to convince people of stuff. Um, and, um... Oh, yeah, and so one of the elements here is that Littlefinger's like, well, you know, Patchface has, like, a mottled, tattooed face, and Shireen has, like, that grey, stony, grayscale, half-frozen face. So, you know, people will think there's a connection there. And and Pycelle is like, well, but, you know, Shireen's face is caused by grayscale, and Patchface's face is caused by tattoos. So there's no actual connection there. But, of course, like, facts are irrelevant in, like, this world of fake news, right? Like, facts facts don't matter. You can rely on people's ignorance, you can rely on people's not doing due diligence, and you can just say ridiculous things and it'll convince people of stuff. And so Cersei's, Cersei gives gives Littlefinger the sort of smile that she customarily reserved for Jamie. Lord Peter, you are a wicked creature. And I think it's so great how, like, Cersei's so barefacedly... Um, she values people, she values men for their capacity to lie for her and cheat for her, like Jamie does, you know? Cersei is such a user in terms of her relationship. She only values people if they can help her do her dirty business for her. Um, and Tyrion, less warmly, says that Littlefinger is a most accomplished liar. He's more dangerous than I knew. Because, of course, Littlefinger... Because, of course, Tyrion is aware that Littlefinger... Uh, well, at least suspects that Littlefinger lied about that Valyrian steel dagger that got Catelyn to arrest Tyrion and almost got Tyrion killed. And Tyrion has been thinking about moving against Littlefinger as revenge. Um, so there's that whole dynamic happening there as well between Tyrion and Littlefinger. Um... So they talk about this lie and uh, they don't want to like publish the lie themselves. So they suggest that uh, Varys and Littlefinger can, oh no, Littlefinger says that he can, he can spread the rumors of Stannis being cuckolded by Patchface around the brothels of King's Landing uh, and Varys can do the same. Um, and they say, well, where is Varys? Why isn't he even at this meeting? And Pycelle says, the spider spins his secret webs day and night. I mistrust that one, my lords. Um, which is which is a lovely line. And of course, it's like also very true. Like, Pycelle is like very often foolish, uh, but he's completely right about Varys having... Uh, Varys having... Uh, uh, oh, fuck, what's the term? Ulterior motives, secret plans. He ain't loyal. Um, so... 
they plan to send out the fake news and then Tyrion heads out of the meeting and he's like, yo, I got a little plan. I got a gift for Joffrey. I'm making a little chain. Um, and Cersei's like, why does why does Joffrey need more jewelry? Why does he need more little necklaces and chains and things? But Tyrion's like, no, 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 I've got a better, I've got a better chain in mind. And of course, what Tyrion is planning is the gigantic mega chain that he uses to trap Stannis's ships inside Blackwater Bay when he attacks them with wildfire. That's something that they didn't include in the show. Just a little detail, but kind of a cool detail. And of course, this is one of these things that, like, they don't actually reveal what Tyrion's plan is with this chain until, like, chapters and chapters later. Because uh, George Martin will never clarify something when he can, you know, leave you in confusion and suspense instead. Like, like it's it's easy to forget once you've read these books a zillion times, but, like, there's a lot of obfuscation and ambiguity when you're reading these things for the first time and you don't know what's going on, which can make it really hard for first-time readers to understand this stuff, and indeed for second, third, and fourth readers, uh, which is part of the joy of it, but it, it does make these books kind of inaccessible to a lot of people. Um, so they head out, and, uh, and Tyrion goes to a meeting with the smiths of King's Landing, all the blacksmiths that he's got building this chain for him. And Bronn says, they're awaiting your pleasure. And Tyrion says, hmm, waiting my pleasure. I like the ring of that. Um, and then when he enters the audience chamber with all the smiths inside, uh, the steward cries out, Tyrion Lannister, hand of the king. And Tyrion likes that too. Because, uh, of course, part of what Tyrion's arc in this book is about is how much he loves power. He loves lording it over people, and he loves um, having status and people having to bow down to him. Because, of course, you know he he's felt like um, he's been he's he's been lorded over all his life, and he hasn't had any respect all his life. So he enjoys having this respect and stuff, which is kind of like understandable. But it's also you know it's rather similar to Cersei, isn't it? Like Cersei's whole thing, like like her first line in her first chapter in Feast is like that. You know, she sat the Iron Throne, and everyone had to bow down before her. Tyrion has that like exact same instinct of like wanting everyone to submit to him, uh, which is this really like hateful, destructive impulse. Um, Tyrion's, Tyrion's like not a good guy, guys. Tyrion's, Tyrion's kind of a bit of a baddie and increasingly so in the later books. Um, and he's got his mate Podrick Payne as his squire. Um, and Tyrion had never quite gotten over the suspicion that his father had inflicted the boy on him as a joke. Uh, and yet, the joke kind of backfires against Tywin, because Podrick ends up saving Tyrion's life at the end of the book, which, uh, which Tywin, I'm sure, would prefer he did not. Um, and Tyrion also has his uh, mountain clansmen of the moon uh, guarding him, the moon brothers and the black ears and the, and the burned men and all those, which is just a lovely image of like the dwarf, the hand of the king, guarded by all his mountain savages and Bronn, the sellsword. Um, and Tyrion is also wearing a different kind of chain. He's wearing his hand of the king chain, which is a, a loop of solid gold hands. Um, which, of course, is the chain that he later uses to strangle Shay to death. Um, and he's wearing a cape, and he's, and he's looking all swag. He's got his bling, he's got his ice, he's looking super hella fresh. Dab, dab, it's going to be great. Um, uh, and, uh, well, and yeah, like, with the chains, like, I think it's cool how, you know, he's got this... He's got this chain with which he will, uh, defeat Stannis in, um in the Battle of the Blackwater, this giant chain, and he's got this other chain with which he will kill Shay. There's a sort of neat reflection there. Um, and... MTR in the, in, in the live chat says that uh, they prefer the pin in the show, the King of the Hand, the Hand of the King pin that they use instead of the chain. And I can understand that, although there is, like, further awesome uh, symbolism to the Hand of the Chain thing, because remember, like, that, um... Remember that song about, like, uh, hands of gold are always cold, but a woman's touch is warm is one of the songs in the books, and, like, that also sort of connects to the necklace. And, like, there's a few other things. There's a bunch more symbolism, like this really neat sort of wordplay and stuff that they managed to connect into that necklace. I, I think it's actually a really cool symbol. Like, it has a lot of sort of angles to it. Anyway, uh, so he goes and he meets with all these smiths. He's gathered all these smiths, armorers, and ironmongers, 
George Martin loves that word mongers. He's got cheese mongers and iron mongers and spice mongers and all sorts of mongers. Mongery, mongrels, m- m- mongols, all sorts of folks. Anyway, um, so he hoists himself up on the high seat and he says, yo, uh, here's a chain link. I want you to make a thousand more just like them. Um, and Tyrion says, this one chain, it's, it's mighty but short, somewhat like me. Uh, and I want a whole lot more of them. I want every forge in King's Landing turned to making these links. Because, like, fuck the economy, right? Like, I'm just gonna walk in and tell everyone to drop what they're doing. An entire industry, every- Like, imagine if you just walked up and says, Alright, everyone who makes iPhones, I want you guys to make, uh, remote control cars instead, because I need- I need a bunch. Um, I'm, and granted, that's a great way to get a whole lot of um, remote control cars made, but everyone who relies on iPhones suddenly has a problem. And that's one of the advantages and disadvantages of like autocracy, right? Like any government where like one dude controls what everyone's doing. You can get shit done quick, but there's also a lot of disruption to a lot of people that can occur. Y- y- do you guys ever hear the, the tragedy of um, Darth Mao the Wise? Um, so, so, so this fella, I don't know if you've heard of him, fella named, uh, Mao Zedong, uh, took over a little land called China, and, uh, he had this great idea called, called the Great Leap Forward and the Economic Revolution, and he was gonna make China modern and amazing and great, and he's like, okay, here's what we need, we need to make a whole lot of grain for food, and we need to make a whole lot of metal, a whole lot of iron to, like, build stuff, it's gonna be great, uh, I'm in charge of everyone, everyone listen to me, we're gonna sort this shit out right, right proper. And so Mao was like, everyone, no matter what you're doing, drop everything. I want you to make grain and I want you to make iron. Um, and so he sent out all these minions and bureaucrats to like make sure everyone was making enough iron. And everyone and all the bureaucrats were trying to like impress Mao with how much iron that they could make. And they were all tripping over each other to make so much iron um, that they just made really shitty iron. It got to the point where like like they didn't have enough like iron ore and whatever the fuck. So they just started getting like bicycles and like farm tools and like just random shit. Just, just all the metal they could find, like the crappest quality, rusty ass shit, and they just threw it, melted it down into furnaces, and they made like the crappiest quality pig iron that you could imagine. That was like completely useless. Um, but 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 Mao was like, man, I just need this fucking iron. I just need this iron, bro. Um, but and and they were literally like destroying farming tools to make worthless iron and then they couldn't farm anymore and all the things that they were doing before they were making the iron they weren't doing anymore so like and then and then like the grain and like and, and like the bu- all right so here's the other thing that happened like all the bureaucrats because like in this like massive bureaucracy everyone's like like it's all corrupt and everyone's lying and everyone's trying to impress each other and so the bureaucrats like inflated the amount of grain that they were growing like they said oh we we got like a, a, a thousand tons of grain in this village um when they only actually made a hundred so then Mao's like, oh, great, we've got so much grain, we might as well sell a bunch of it. So he, like, gets all the grain, and he, like, sells it overseas. But since he since he was told they had more than they actually had, they sold all the grain, and they had none less to eat. So everyone's fucking starving. No one's... All the iron's worthless. They've got fucking nothing. Um, and yeah, zillions of people starved. It's, like, one of the biggest mass losses of life in history. Um, when all these farmers... Um, when when the whole, whole economy... of, of of this country, of this massive part of the world. Uh, one guy tried to revolutionize it all and uh, e- everything went tits up. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't know much about this stuff, but, but like apparently there were a lot of actual like progress and advantages. Like Mao actually did accomplish some good things, but he also was a fucking psycho and was ruinous in a lot of other ways. One of the other great stories is the uh, let, a, let a Thousand Flowers Bloom or whatever it's called, um, which is when he's like, all right, here's the thing. Guys, I'm not just a tyrant. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a good leader. I'm going to listen to my people. I want to learn. This is, this is a communist utopia that we're building. Everyone's going to pitch in. So I want to hear suggestions. I'm going to make a suggestion box, and I want all the smart people in China to give me some suggestions as to what we should do to improve improve China. And he said, like, by the way, like, Pinky promise, I'm not gonna murder you if you tell me something I don't like. Pinky promise. And so everyone sent in all these, like, suggestions, all the smart people, all the academics, all the intellectuals, and they said, hey, here's a bunch of things you can do to improve China. And Mao's like, mmm... Nah, nah, don't like it. Don't like these. And he fucking murdered a whole bunch of, like, the smartest people in China. Um, which was a bit of a problem. Like, the whole intellectual class was, like, was, like, subjugated and imprisoned and it was a massive, massive pain in the ass. Um, 
So, uh, so yeah, so that was kind of a downer. I, I, I do wonder sometimes, though, like, like the way these stories are told in, like, Western institutions um, that are ruled by, like, a capitalist system. Like, I think there is, like, an incentive structure for, for like, Western places to tell very negative stories about, like, Eastern communist systems, especially, like, back in, like, C- Cold War or whatever. Like... Like, I imagine that especially in those times, like, Western universities, governments would want to spread negative stories about communism um, and those sorts of and those sorts of regimes. So I do wonder if there's like a certain amount of bias um, and a certain amount of exaggeration in some of those tales. Um, and, and, and certainly tales are told very differently in, in China and in the East, right? Like there's a lot of places, um, there's a lot of, like a lot of people in China still fucking love Mao, despite everything that went down. Um, so it's kind of hard to know the truth in some of these situations, uh, sort of looping back to all that (coughs) fake news we was talking about. So anyway, that was a ill-informed tangent. So we're making a whole bunch of chains, um, and... And yeah, the Smith's like, hey, but the Queen told us to make to make swords and daggers and shields and armor to 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 like prepare for like you know Stannis and arming the new gold cloaks. And Tyrion's like, no, 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 that can wait. Make the chain first. And then the Smith gets really anxious and he's like, well, you're telling us to make a chain, but but the Queen Cersei uh, told us to make a whole bunch of swords. So like, what the fuck are we meant to do? Queen tells us one thing, uh, Hand of the King tells us another thing. It's like you know, like 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 when you're a kid and your parents are getting divorced and like Dad says like, do the the laundry and your mum says mow the lawn and it's like oh fuck what do i do uh you know that guy's like sweating with like the two buttons to press uh getting torn torn apart like that is never like there's no good option you just got to choose who you piss off and usually and usually like when you're in that situation you just gotta you just gotta uh, obey whoever is the biggest asshole. usually like if one boss is telling you one thing another boss is telling you another thing like you just go with whoever would get you in the most trouble if you don't do what they said which empowers tyrants right like whoever's a bigger asshole, people will just obey them um which is uh which is also a problem geez this is politics isn't it um so uh so yeah sweet cersei Tyrion thinks, always striving to make the small folk love us, because Cersei has threatened to crush the hands of any smith who doesn't make enough swords for her. And I like that in uh, in Book 4, that they name a, a ship, a, a big new warship, Sweet Cersei, uh, which is, of course, one of the more deeply ironic uh, terms in the story. Um, so, we're going to need a bunch of iron, we're going to need a bunch of stuff, and Tyrion's like, yeah, yeah, no, don't, don't worry, like, you know, Lord Baelish, Littlefinger will pay for everything, it'll be cool. Uh, which, of course, just puts everyone in more debt to Littlefinger, and it just plays into Littlefinger's hands, controlling the purse strings of the, of the realm. Um, and, and, of course, like, Littlefinger also benefited, like, before, when, like, Littlefinger was like, oh, let's spread rumors against Stannis, while Stannis is spreading rumors against us. Because that just discredits all of the highborn, right? Like, Stannis and and Cersei are in this, like, propagandistic slug match mudslinging contest. And, like, here's the thing about a mudslinging contest, as I learned in Croatia in the 70s. Uh, the real winner in a, in a mudslinging contest is the mud. Uh, because no one... The winner of a mudslinging contest is always hella muddy, you know? Um, no one gets out of even, no one gets out of a mud singing contest unmudded is what is what they say. Um, so the person who benefits in that situation is Littlefinger when um, when all the high lords are just are just are just delegitimizing each other um, because he like hates the upper classes and he wants to empower himself and to rise up. Chaos is a ladder, yada yada. Um, so find iron, melt down every horseshoe in this city if you must. Tyrion says, which is so much like Mao telling him, telling everyone to melt down all their tools and melt down all their whatever. Um, and so an older man comes forward and he's like, man, like I'm a, I'm like a master smith. I make like really dope ass stuff. Like it's kind of a waste of time for me to make these chains. Like I should be making like more like complex, like masterworks. I should be making awesome swords and armor. I should be making chains. And Tyrion's like, uh, nah, fuck you. You're making chains. Uh, which again shows like wasting people's talents, you know, in this, in this system. So Lorion is the guy's name, um, and uh, and there's a and there's a dwarf joke in there. High office, Tyrion's high office, um, and someone sniggers, um, someone sniggers at Tyrion, which he hates. 
Um, and so he says, you will make chains or you will wear them. And again, like, that's kind of similar to, like, Cersei. Like, Cersei is really, like, cruel and blunt when people disobey her and question her power and undermine her. And and just after Tyrion was like, man, Cersei's so cruel for threatening to break people's hands. And now Tyrion is threatening to, to imprison this armorer for, for not wanting to have to make chains. Um, so, you know, Tyrion and Cersei are not that dissimilar. Not that dissimilar. Um, and... Uh, oh and so and so and so the smith's like oh yo i'm gonna make you this awesome helmet like instead of making chains i should make you an awesome helmet like a demon's head and it's gonna like terrify people and like i think that like it can seem really goofy to us to be making like animal head helmets and all this crazy stuff uh because like that wouldn't be very that wouldn't be very spooky to us but i think that like in this like medieval context where like the internet doesn't exist like you've never seen a fucking demon head made of iron before like the scariest you thing you've ever seen is like the back end of a pig um and so if you saw like a, a mounted dwarf with an axe with the with the head of a demon in like the context of battle and war and blood and fire that probably would be scary as shit it's like um like you ever go to like you ever see like ancient temples in like asia and whatever that have like all these sort of gargoyly like spooky wooky monstrous statues that like guard the temples and whatever um those things look look real silly now, but back in the day, they were probably terrifying, especially when they were like fully like painted up and decorated, and 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 you know when you've still got like a sneaking like twenty percent suspicion that demons are like legit real, um, in that sort of worldview, you know that shit that shit would be spooky. Um, the costumery and the appearances actually are meaningful. I mean, it's like the wealth stuff as well. Like, like you go to like a Catholic church, you go to like Notre Dame, like back in the old days, and you look up at those like high vaulted ceilings and those like painted murals and frescoes and these illuminated like statues of, of, of Jebediah JC with his abs poking out and his blood coming down. And it's like, holy shit, like you ain't never seen nothing like that. And if this church, if the guy who is in charge of this place says that like, you know, Scott our daddy's real and you better give us some donations then it's like well fuck like he's probably legit you know if he's got all this wealth all this appearances all this like spookery so like you don't argue with that um less so now um and Tyrion talks about how he's been uh, doing some stuff to feed the hungry city. Uh, he's been sending fishing boats, and he sent the gold cloaks out to find food, foraging. And of course, like that sounds innocent enough, but we know that foraging means that like so soldiers go into villages and just like shaking them down for food and money and stuff, stealing, which has like a human cost, you know. Um, so it seems innocent enough, but it's not without a cost. Um, and so Tyrion's on his way. Uh, he's traveling deeper into the city, um, and he looks around at all these, like, random peasants, all these passers-by who are watching him. And Tyrion plays a little game, trying to sort the informers from the rest. So he's just looking at, like, random pedestrians, and he's like, Oh, you must be a spy for someone. You must be out to get me. Which, like, seems, like, hyper-paranoid, right? Like, and that's another trait that Tyrion shares with Cersei. Like, Cersei is unreasonably hyper-paranoid, thinking that everyone's out to get her. Um, of course, you know, there is an element of truth to this, because there are a lot of spies, and there are a lot of people out to get Tyrion and Cersei, so maybe it's not totally unreasonable. And again, like, that's where all of the, like, craziest personality defects come from, is, like, real survival strategies. Like, the, the worst aspects of people's personalities, the most, like, destructive habits, and, like, addictions, and, like, overreactions, and traumas, they all come from, like, some actual real situation that you were in at some point in which you needed this reaction you needed that fear or that anger or that hate or that like hyper reaction that hyper vigilance like that's something that you need to help you survive at some point um the problem is when that sticks around is when you like stay hyper vigilant after the threat's over and you keep that fear and that anger and it outlasts its usefulness and that's how people get all fucked up sometimes i think uh, and that's certainly true of um of cersei and Tyrion and and of us all. Hashtag, hashtag, deep, hashtag memes. Um, and so he's looking out for informers, and then he arrives at a house that is two stories tall, stone below and timber above, with a round turret. Many of the windows were leaded, and from, and from the door swung an ornate lamp, a globe of gilded metal and scarlet glass. They arrive at a brothel. 
And I think it's really interesting that symbol of the red light, meaning a brothel. Like, the red light district is like this ubiquitous concept, like, all over the world. Any, in any city, the place where all the brothels are is the red light district. And I'd love to know why that's the case. Why do red lights mean, mean prostitution and sex work? I don't know. There must be some fascinating history there, because it's so common and it's so everywhere. Um, and so they head into the brothel and Bronn's like, man, what do you want to do at a brothel? Like, I thought you were into Shay. Um, and Tyrion's like, eh, nah, you know, Shay's all right. But like, you know, I'm interested in other women as well. And so what Tyrion's doing is he's covering his interest in Shay by going to this brothel. And he's actually going to go through this like secret passage to get to Shay. Um, so he's, he, he's using like going to a brothel to hide his actual interest in, in, in Shay. And I think that's a good example of him like Tyrion's advice in the first book about like using your reputation as armor. You know, everyone thinks that Tyrion is just like this lecherous dwarf. Um, and Tyrion's using this idea that he's he's just out to smang, um, and he's using that to hide his real feelings and his real genuine passion for Shay uh, by creating this image of ah uh, he just he doesn't care and he's just going to all these girls at these brothels. Um, so I think that's I think that's uh, interesting. Um, and apparently this was a, a great favorite of Robert, like King Robert used to come to this brothel all the time. Um, although Bronn suggests, oh, maybe Joffrey, maybe Joffrey should come to this brothel. An interesting notion, Joffrey thinks. And, like, to the best of my knowledge, they never do that thing where, like, you know in the show where, um, where Joffrey buys, uh, prostitutes for Joffrey, um, and he murders them, like Roz and the other girl? I'm pretty sure they never do that in the books. And yet there's this like sort of hint that he might he's thinking about doing it here, which I think is interesting. Maybe D&D like took inspiration from that line to create that scene in the show. Um and so Tyrion's like, yeah, like Bronn and the Black Ears, you can go hang out down the brothels, but I'm going into this special nice brothel which is run by Shatea, who we're about to meet. So he's like, you guys go have fun, and I'm going to go inside. So he meets Shatea, or maybe they've met before. Um, and Tyrion's trying to be all anonymous, like, ooh, names are dangerous. Um, and they heads into this brothel, and it smells of exotic spice. And there's a mosaic of two women entwined in love. You have a pleasant establishment, Tyrion says. And Shatea says, I have labored long to make it so. And her voice is flowing amber, liquid with the accents of the distant summer isles. And I don't know what a voice sounds like if it's flowing amber. I suppose that means it's smooth. Um, but I don't know, I don't know what that really sounds like. It does sound nice, though. Um, and so they head in, and Shatea's like, man, I got so many great girls for you here. They are beautiful, and they are skilled in every art of love. And of course, that's, that's really what you want in your lovemaking, is like a high degree, it's all about skill. It's all about precision, you know? It's all, it's all, it's all about, it's all in the flick of the wrist, right? Like, you really just want that clinical, surgical precision, skill, you know, practice. That's what sex is about, right? And then there's all these women uh, in this uh, behind this Moorish screen carved with flowers and fancies and dreaming maidens. And I love the atmosphere of this place. It's painting this lavish picture of exoticism and um, and all this all this ornate beauty. Um, and uh, and yeah, this screen it peers unseen into a common room. So there's like this sort of like you can look into this room, but they can't see that you're looking. And uh, that reminds me of this really cool scene in the show where you see you see you see this this patron of the brothel at one of Littlefinger's brothels like looking through a peephole at a couple of people having sex and then like it zooms out and then you see Littlefinger looking through another peephole in on the guy who's looking through the peephole at the people having sex which I think is this like this wonderful like visual image of like the sort of like pyramid of power you know like the social like str like people controlling other people people watching people watching people watching people which is very much this thing in game of thrones of like you know blood raven is watching down on duran martel who's watching down on varus who's watching down on you know there's this whole sort of hierarchy of power which i think the peepholes in the in, in this show scene did quite well there's a drunken tyrushi with a buxom young wench um, there's, uh, someone playing chess, there's, there's all sorts of stuff going on, um, and Tyrion feels a stirring in his groin, um, and, and Shatea says, I would respectfully suggest the dark-skinned girl, she's referring to her 
daughter Alayaya. And Tyrion says, oh, she's young. And, and, um, and Chitea says, oh, she has had 16 years. Uh, which, which, like, like, one of the constant undercurrents in A Song of Ice and Fire is, like, there's, like, really young people having sex and being married, which is, like, constantly uncomfortable to the modern reader. Like, like Daenerys, you know, not the least, is, like, super young when, like, she's having sex with Drogo. And, like, there's different ways you can sort of react to that. Like, you could say that George Martin is sort of, like, challenging us with, like, a reality of medieval life that, like, really young people had sex. And he's, like, challenging us and, like, problematizing us and, like, like trying to, like, you know, grapple with something genuinely complicated. But I also wonder if George R. R. Martin is just, like, trying to titillate and if it's just sort of, like, it's just sort of, ooh, it's, it's exciting and, ooh, weird that all these, like, young people are having sex. And so, like, it's sort of up to the reader to decide whether that's, like, gross or whether it's, like like challenging and it's like actually trying to confront something real um choose your own adventure i think um and uh, who are we talking about yeah Tyrion remembers taisha and so Tyrion's like whole like attitudes towards women was so shaped by his initial uh tryst with this girl taisha who he was told by Jamie was a whore, and then he found out, he finds out later in the next book that she wasn't, um, and he has this whole, like, twisted sense of, like, betrayal, and he doesn't trust women, and he's got all these misogynistic ideas that all came from his relationship with Taisha, who he then, like, he then projects his experience with Taisha onto every other woman, every other woman he meets. Um, which is, like, where, like, the discrimination and prejudice and misogyny and racism comes from, right? Like, people have, like, one bad experience or one perceived bad experience with one person, and then they just project that negative quality onto every other person in that, like, perceived category. Um, and that's where we get, like, hate and prejudice, right? Um, it's when we think that one person's faults or even just perceived faults apply to everybody else, even if that first person didn't actually do anything wrong, as in the case of Taisha. Um, so Tyrion's all fucked up. He's got all sorts of trauma and all sorts of fucked up attitudes as a result of that. Um, so yeah, Shatea, uh, talks about her daughter, uh, Alayaya. Um, and yeah, like, Shatea is, like, pimping her daughter, Alaya. Like, she's saying, hey, like, you know, do you want to ha have sex with my daughter? And Tyrion shows surprise on his face when she says that. And Shatea's like, no, nah, like, you know, in my culture, there's no shame in the pillow house. There's no shame with having sex. Um, in the Summer Isles, where she comes from, there are people uh, who... Gr it's greatly esteemed, people who are skilled at giving pleasure. And many high-born youths, they serve for a few years uh, as, um, as people who have sex at the temples to honor the gods um which is a nice sort of like enlightened idea isn't it the idea of just being like chilled about sex and just having a nice time and not being all uptight about it especially in the context of like this political reality where like the sexual foibles and trysts of the highborn are like plunging the realm into war right like just because cersei wanted to bang jamie that has caused a war, a civil war that kills thousands of people. And like Tyrion with Shay, like just because Tyrion and Shay want to have sex, that causes even more drama and murder and horror. And it's like, it's absurd that like just because like a few people just want to like bump, bump ghibli bits against each other, that means that thousands of people die. That makes no fucking sense. Um, and so it is this like nice idea that wouldn't it be utopic? Wouldn't it be lovely um, if everyone just had sex with who they wanted to and it, there was no shame and it was all great? But like I will note that like shame is like definitely part of the appeal no like like a little bit of little bit of oh this is so wrong oh we shouldn't be doing this oh what if what if my stepmom found out like there's always that, that that like hint of like it's wrong i think is definitely part of the fun of like a lot of different kind of activities sex none the least um so i don't know if this whole like utopic notion of like the summer islands where like sex is just chilled would actually be as utopic as they say but it has to be better than people dying for the, the war for cersei's cunt remember when they talk what jamie calls it that in the fourth book i think he calls the war of the five kings the war for cersei's cunt and like that's very crude but that's kind of what it is thousands of people died because of because of some some sexual behavior deemed wrong which is just so fucking ridiculous um, and yeah, so Sh Shatea is like, yeah, like, our people, we worship the gods with sex because they gave us voices to sing and they gave us bodies to fuck, and so why should we not do that? And Tyrion says, well, if I could pray with my cock, I'd be much more religious. Um, some do, I'm sure. 
Um, and so Tyrion meets Alayaya, and she has only the slightest hint of her mother's accent. Um, th- th- these are some of, like, the only Summer Islanders who we meet in the story. Like, who else is there? There's, like, Jalabar Jo. Who else? Very few. Um, and you can definitely, like, criticize, like, the whole sort of, like, exoticism of the way Tyrion uses, like, foreign peoples in his story. Um, and so takes her down up the tower. Um, like, so Tyrion's pretending that he's going to go and have sex with Alayaya when his actual plan is to go through the secret tunnel to go with Shay. And, uh, and Tyrion's cock pressed against the lacing of his breeches. And again, like, you know, when, when whenever A Song of Ice and Fire describes cocks, like, it always, I, I always just get this picture of, like, 88-year-old George R. R. Martin hunched over his world star keyboard with, you know, one hand under the desk, and it's just a little bit grody when when there's the sex stuff, but, you know, uh, one of those too obvious to even mention, you know, facts is like, you know, why should we get so uncomfortable at all this dis- all this description of sex when, you know, a few chapters later we're, we've got descriptions of people cutting each other's heads off, and it's like, well, that's fine, like, that's ridiculous. Anyway, so they're going up the, the tower, and Tyrion's like, ah, oh, you're very beautiful, Ella, yeah, yeah. Um, and yet now the part that interests me most is your tongue. And Alayaya says, my lord will find that my tongue is well schooled. When I was a girl, I learned when to use it and when not. And this girl's fucking 16 years old. Um, and, uh, and Tyrion's like, uh, what should we do now? Uh, let's go through the wardrobe. Um, and so Alayaya guides Tyrion into this wardrobe that has a secret panel that slides back and then he goes down this ladder and he goes down into this secret tunnel so this whole thing is an elaborate cover for Tyrion to pretend that he's just going to see Alayaya and the other sex workers at, at Shatea's brothel when he's actually going off to see Shay um and so Varys meets him down in the tunnel because Varys is like uh is orchestrating this whole thing with the tunnel and Varys is is also in disguise just like Tyrion Varys is hiding his true activities and Varys has all these like prosthetics and stuff on he's got a scarred face and he's got stubble because he's pretending to be this character Rugen who he pretends to be um and so Tyrion heads downstairs and Tyrion's like are you sure that like Shatea can keep the secret of like this secret passage and all this and Varys is like, I am certain of nothing in this fickle and treacherous world. Uh, but, you know, Shatea probably wouldn't sell us to the Queen because Shatea is thankful that you got rid of Alardim. Um, because Alardim, the previous leader of one, or like the second in command of the Gold Cloaks, um, uh, has no love for Shatea. Uh, so, you know, surprise, surprise. It seems as though there may have been some conflict between the, the sex workers and the law enforcement, which is a story as old as time. Um, and so Tyrion observes that, you know, even Varys's walk is different when he's walking around in this, in this costume, in this pretense of being Rugen. And I always think, like, it's a little bit of, like, a Chekhov's gun, almost, that, like, we have this, like, incredible disguise, um ability that Varus has and yet he hasn't used it very much for anything like super consequential yet like I'm just sort of waiting for the for the chapter uh, in in the story ahead when when some weird character does something really significant and it's like whoa who is this guy and then like Varus like pulls off like the the James Bond like prosthetic face mask and whoa it was Varus all along uh, like, you know Dario takes off his beard and whoa it's it's actually Varus like that would be cool because I feel like they could do that because Varus like they've established so many times that Varus has this amazing disguise ability but they haven't actually uh, he hasn't used it for anything like ultra significant yet uh, as far as I can see. And Varys is like, yeah, no, you know, I just, I do these, I use these disguises so that I can live to serve you longer. Because Varys is the ultimate survivor and he keeps on paddling. Um, and so they head on through this tunnel um, and they're looking out for spies. Um, and Varys mentions that, yeah, some of Cersei's spies are actually secretly Varys's spies. Um, and... Uh, and Tyrion rather poetically says that, well, you know, I'd hate to be climbing through wardrobes and suffering the pangs of frustrated lust all for naught. Um, and to translate that, what what he's saying in uh, in the hashtag, uh, the way the way the kids would say it is that he's thirsty for a smang. Um, so he hopes he didn't climb through this tunnel for nothing. Um, How is it that a brothel happens to have a secret entrance? Tyrion asks. And Varys says that the tunnel was dug for another king's hand, whose honour would not allow to enter such a house openly. 
So the question is raised, who is this other Hand of the King who built this tunnel? Why would this tunnel exist out of a brothel? Why would a king's hand do it? And one of the great theories is that Tywin did it. Because, like, one of the great contradictions of Tywin as a character is that he's super uptight about, ah, oh, you know, whores are so terrible and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he, he, he whipped his father's mistress through the streets and he, he's uncompromising about sexual morality as he perceives it. When, in reality, Tywin is a massive fucking hypocrite and Shay ends up in Tywin's bed. Um, so a lot of people believe that this tunnel might have been built by Tywin so that he could um, get a get a get a cheeky root on the sly, as they say. Um, and you know maybe if he didn't build it, then he might at least have used it. I think that's very plausible. Because um, isn't yeah? There's also like a secret tunnel in Tywin's bedchamber, I believe, uh, which might be connected to this tunnel or something. You know, it's it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole thing. So they're going through the tunnel. Varys found out about it through his little birds, uh, and they come up through the tunnel to a stable, uh, uh, from which uh, Tyrion can proceed to Shay's uh, Shay's manse, uh, and he looks at this uh, little shitty horse that he's going to ride there, and he and he takes a look at the teeth. Because that's how you judge a horse. You, you got to look at the teeth, and you got to count the rings on the teeth to see, to see how old the horse is. I believe that's how that works. Um, and Varys is like, yeah, you know, it's not a it's not a great horse, but uh, but it'll it'll do, and it won't at- attract attention, which is the main thing. All about appearances, all about lies. King's Landing is a bed of lies. Uh, bed bed in in more ways than one. Um, men see what they expect to see, Varys says, which is something he repeats. Like that, that particular line occurs a lot, um, and and people and he's saying, well, you know, just wear this cloak, and people are going to think you're a child, not a dwarf, and it's going to be fine. Uh, and so Tyrion's like, yep, Shay awaits me, and he heads off to see Shay. Um, and Varys saddles him for him, and they discuss the small council meeting. Um, and Tyrion's like, I wonder how Stannis got this idea that Cersei and Jaime are the parents of Joffrey. I wonder where that came from. Um, and Varys thinks, hmm, perhaps someone whispered it in his ear. Um, and Tyrion thinks, Littlefinger? And Varys says, I named no name. So it's possible that, that Littlefinger was the one uh, who told Stannis about all this and, you know, created this chaos and this conflict. Um, and so Varys uh, talks about Robert's bastards and how he has eight of them. Uh, and they talk about, like, the hair color thing. The seed is strong. Um, and Tyrion's like, man, you know, Cersei, Cersei should have just, like, had one of Robert's children. Because if, like, if Cersei had at least one black-haired child of Robert, then, like, the whole incest thing wouldn't be as obvious. So, like, man, like, she just, she just sort of had a kid with Robert. That would, that, that wouldn't have been so hard. Um, which I think is, like, hilariously easy to say, um, for, t- for Tyrion to say that Cersei should have just, like, bore a child for, like, the abusive husband who she hated. No big deal, right? Uh, and then on the final page, Tyrion uh, gets off the gets onto the horse and says, "Lord Varys, sometimes I feel as though you are the best friend I have in King's Landing, and sometimes I feel you are my worst enemy." And Varys says, "How odd! I think quite the same of you." And I think there's kind of a tragedy there because, like, Tyrion in this moment is like sort of wanting to see Varys as like an equal and like a rival and a colleague. When in actual fact, like, Varys is like so many levels above Tyrion in the game right now because Varys has this whole fucking thing going on uh, with um, with like Young Griff and like Daenerys and Drogo and Illyrio Mepatis and all that stuff, which Var- which Tyrion has no idea of. Like, Varys is Varys is such a puppet master, so far above. Tyrion, uh, that it's kind of sad that Tyrion thinks that Varys is like something near his equal, and of course Varys is probably planning right now to um, to eventually like steal away Tyrion as he does at the end of Book Three, and to use him as an asset in the Young Griff plot. So so Varys is probably just like manipulating Tyrion, trying to like trying to like uh, groom him to be a future ally. Um, and so it's a bit sad how Tyrion is being totally played here, because that's kind of what that's kind of what Clash is about for Tyrion. It's about him getting power and enjoying power but it ultimately, like, collapsing against him. Like, Tyrion has power for a while, but, like, it all crumbles away, and he doesn't get to hold on to anything, and it all turns to ashes in his mouth. Um, and he ends up humiliated and broken and depressed, and so it, it all... He flies too close to the sun, and he... And it all turns to shit, so... 
So uh, so it's it's fun. It's a fun arc because, you know, we've got so much of this high drama because, of course, sex and politics are the spiciest topics for 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 drama and blood and tears. But um, but it all ends in tragedy. Uh, lightning round Q&A. Uh, someone in the chat says, uh, could we do a, could we do a schedule for these abridged videos? Um, I don't think we're going to have a schedule, uh, anytime soon. I think that maybe in the future we'll return to some kind of regularity, but I think for now it's going to be, uh, when, when the fancy strikes us. Um, because, you know, Swift is a, Swift is a, it's an elusive, it's a, it's an elusive vibe, you know, you can't just make this shit happen. You gotta, you gotta let, let the juju come from above when, you know, the time is right. Uh, I spend a lot of time examining the entrails of birds to figure out, uh, when, um, when the omens are correct to, uh, to do a Swift episode. And, uh, tonight was, uh, Today was one of those days. Um, so yeah, if you all want to hang out, you can go and check out the Swift Discord. Link is in the description. You can check out the Swift Facebook group. Um, otherwise, make sure you uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. There is a podcast feed, so you can listen to this as as audio. You don't have to watch it on YouTube. There is an audio podcast. Uh, but we will try and do another episode soon. Um, Helsius Cabral says, ever thought about covering George Martin's sci-fi stories, like Tough Voyaging? Yeah, George Martin has some pretty amazing sci-fi stories. And yeah, we could totally do some Alt Shrift episodes on them. Um, I think it makes sense, I think it makes more sense to focus on Song of Ice and Fire for now. Um, but yeah, like when we feel like, uh, shaking it up a bit, we could check some of those out. Because there are definitely some fascinating interconnections between George Martin's old sci-fi stories and Song of Ice and Fire and indeed um and indeed uh they're just cool stories in their own right um will there be another live show Schubert says there was a live Alt Swift X show in uh in Alameda California no Alameda yeah California not so long ago maybe there could Wherever you least expect it, whenever you least expect it, there might be another live IRL Alt Shift X Game of Thrones abridged episode. You never know. Um, uh, we'll probably announce it like like more in advance if we do that again. Uh, Warm Soul Light says, "Will the audio podcast be on Spotify?" Um, it is on Spotify, I believe. Uh, yeah, it is on Spotify. You can like just search it up, or I'll add a link to the description. Charles Halson says, please release book one onto Apple Podcasts. Yeah, so at the moment, the, the first, like, 80 episodes or something of this series are only on YouTube, not on the podcast. And yeah, like, one day I'll go back and add all of them. Maybe I'll do that soon. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure, like, if it'll spam everyone's feeds if I do that. Um, maybe we'll do more Animorphs. Yeah. When do you reckon Wins will be released? Uh, well, I haven't finished it yet. So, ooh, ooh shit, I gave it away. Um, I don't know when wins will come out. I, 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 I'm a damn fool because I do have some hope that wins might actually come out this year because George Martin said that, oh, you know, I'm going to get it out before Worldcon. I'm going to bring the manuscript or else you can imprison me in New Zealand. Uh, but that seems, um, that seems unlikely if we're going to be totally honest. Um... Are we allowed to ask about Alt Shift ZZZ? Says Thick Thighs. You're allowed to ask about Alt Shift ZZZ. I don't really know. I don't really know much about Alt Shift ZZZ's movements uh, or what kind of what kind of operation that is, but uh, I can speculate. Matt says, "When is the Euron video coming?" I know little and less about what Alt Shift X is up to. That 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 Alt Shift X's problem is is they spend far too much time thinking and researching like a big old nerd, which uh, really slows down the release schedule. Um, so uh, so it might be a while for that year on video, but we'll see what happens. Um, and, uh, and yeah, all right. So thank you for participating in this uh, podcast. And we'll do some more episodes soon. Subscribe to the podcast. Go go, go and go and re review the podcast on on Apple Podcasts. You bloody nincompoops! Write some write some reviews. If someone writes a review, I'll give you a gold star tomorrow. But I assume that that's important because every other podcaster says that. I'll tell you a secret. I don't actually know what that does, but um, 
but you can do that if you'd like. Um, all right, cool. Cheers. Have a good one. As Hellas Oyster says, stay hydrated, eat some vegetables, uh, call your mum, and see you next time. Cheers.